Glad to do that. As mentioned, today's webinar is called Local Food in Retail, Two Models, One Goal. And um, just a quick orientation about that. Um, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of different dimensions and a lot of different entries, I think, into this food systems work. But at the end of the day, most of us, I dare say, get our food through retail. So using a retail strategy um, to a more good food system is, is a very important way. And there's a variety of different angles on that. And I think what we're going to bring today are two distinct approaches among them. And uh, I think that'll serve all of us in terms of understanding how to work with retail uh, along the supply chain. To that, let me introduce you to Ann Carlin. Uh, let me know, we've got two presenters today. We've got Ann Carlin and Greg Glenn Bergman. We're going to start with Ann. So Ann is the founding director of Fair Food, launched in 2001 to promote humane, sustainable agriculture in Philadelphia region using a market-based approach. In 2003, she launched the Fair Food Farm Stand in the terminal market, which is an enterprise business selling all local products from over nine family farmers and producers. Member of the management team that launched the Common Market Philadelphia in 2008, which is values-driven as that aggregates and distributes local food to area institutions, and Anne also on the Philadelphia Food Policy Advisory Council, appointed by the mayor. So with that, let me uh, hand it over to Anne. Um, hi, John. Thanks uh, to be here today to talk with all of you about the work of Fair Food in general and specifically about our work in good food retail. Fair Food is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2001 by myself and Judy Wicks, who at that time was the owner of the White Dog Cafe. As you can see from this slide, Fair Food is dedicated to bringing local food to the marketplace and promoting a humane, sustainable agriculture system for the Delaware Valley region. After talking with Jeff about who generally attends these webinars, I decided that I would take the first five minutes to give a history and overview of Fair Food's programs and activities. Given that about 50% are from the nonprofit sector, I'm guessing that many of you work for organizations with overlapping goals and strategies and a similar trajectory to Fair Food, so I thought that context would be useful. And I will spend the bulk of the time talking about the Fair Food Farm Stand, which is Fair Food's retail local food grocery store. I'll talk you through the history and growth of the business talk about some of the decisions we've made over the years to blend our mission with our bottom line goals, and then share some details about our business practices. Last few minutes to talk about Local Grower, Local Buyer, Fair Foods annual industry-only event for growers and buyers. As you'll hear, this event started as a simple demonstration back in 2004 and has become one of the major ways that Fair Food brings value to its core constituents. But before we get started, I want to make one quick clarification so it doesn't need to be asked later. At Fair Food, when we say local food, we mean food that was grown about 150 miles from Philadelphia. However, we do not have strict rules around distance traveled, and we sometimes choose to stretch beyond, these defini beyond this definition. It's not really about food miles for us, but rather about promoting appropriate scale farming, have a relationship with the people who grow and produce our food, and contributing to systemic change for our food system. Uh, this is where it began. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the White Dog Cafe, it is a restaurant located in West Philadelphia on the University of Pennsylvania campus. Owner Judy Wick spent many years buying from farmers and producers for her restaurant and reaping the rewards of being a pioneer in the farm-to-table movement. Then day, she had an epiphany and decided that if she really cared about the viability of family farmers and really cared about promoting the local economy and about the health of her customers, she would share her knowledge with her competitors in the field. It was out of this strategy of replicating the white dog model that Fair Food was formed. We began with a narrow mission, connecting local family farmers with Philadelphia's high-end restaurants. And I don't think that uh, the group on this call really needs a primer on why targeting restaurants looked like a workable strategy for keeping small-scale, highly diversified farms on their land. We, like so many others around the country at that time, understood that chefs would value the product, pay a little bit extra, and ultimately, if all went well, create the trend. So since those early days, our work has grown a great deal in scale and in scope with a market-based approach to building supply and demand and connecting the two. But we now work with a wide range of wholesale buyers from restaurants to schools and hospitals and a wide range of growers, including many mid-sized farms in southern New Jersey. I think several years building demand with Philadelphia restaurants and specialty stores, we started to panic a little bit about supply. That's full of growers delivering to the White Dog Cafe 
that early network would never satisfy the demand that we were building in Philadelphia. So we focused our attention on supply. Back then, we developed formal programming, including workshops and publications, along with a lot of one-on-one -on -one consulting with growers. However, for the past many years, this work happened in a more informal way, which I'll discuss later when I talk about the farm stands. To have a better way of describing it, we organize our services to buyers in the form of membership. For years, we gave our services away for free, build supply and demand for local food at a time when people needed convincing of its value. But these day, those days are over, and now we use membership as a way of providing a context for delivering our services while also providing revenue for fair food. We found that businesses are motivated to join Fair Food for one of two reasons. It's either the association with the local food movement and Fair Food's brand, which offer in a number of ways, but primarily through listings in the Philadelphia Local Food Guide, or they want access to our knowledge about sourcing from local farmers that we provide through one-on-one -on -one consultations with all of our members. We also offer events to our members, such as Local Grower, Local Buyer, which I'll discuss later, and our annual Buyer Farm Tour, an event that has become really popular in the past few years. It also does a variety of consumer education activities and events throughout the year. In addition to being the Buy Fresh by Local chapter leader for Philadelphia, we run five farm tours from June through October, and we do monthly tasting events at the farm stand. We also produce the content for Philly's Local Food Guide, which is a comprehensive, list, comprehensive listing of the that serve and sell local food, including restaurants, retail stores, and institutions. With our Farm to Institution program in 2005, which is a subject for another webinar, but for the sake of this presentation, I will say that FTI was Fair Food's entree into a whole new world of food and farming. As we got to know the institutional food service providers in our area, we also built strong relationships with our region's mid-sized farmers who were growing at the appropriate scale to serve these markets. For the few years, FTI has been focused on Philly's Farm to School program, which is a collaboration of several nonprofit organizations and the School District of Philadelphia's Food Services Division. Given Fair Food's mission of bringing local food to the marketplace, Farm to School did make sense until we believed the climate was right for impacting cafeteria meals, an opportunity that finally became available in 2009 when we, along with our partners, started a pilot program that brought fresh local produce into five public schools. This school year, the program is in 25 schools, and we have every reason to believe that it will expand to 50 schools in 2011. The most recent initiative, Double Dollars, was launched in October 2009. Our Double Value Coupon Program mirrors the other programs like it around the country, with the exception of some small but interesting differences that arise when running an incentive program in a retail store as opposed to a farmer's market. Segwaying into the next section of this presentation, the one program I haven't touched on yet is the Fair Food Farm Stand. As you've heard, we do many things at Fair Food, but the Farm Stand is by far our most visible program and the way that many people in Philadelphia know about our work. I'll spend the next 10 minutes or so talking about many of our accomplishments at the Farm Stand and only a few of our challenges, just because it felt really weird to focus it the other way around and spend a lot of time on challenges and only a little on successes. But I wanted out there to everybody listening that I'm really quite comfortable sharing our warts and shortcomings, and, if, and people should just feel free to ask some probing questions. The Fair Food Farm Stand is a local foods retail grocery store. We operate seven days a week, year round, and we sell produce, meat, cheese, dairy, eggs, and value added products sourced from over 90 family farmers and producers. The stand is located in the Reading Terminal Market, and for those of you who don't know the Reading Terminal, it is a large, loud, bustling marketplace in the center of the city with over 70 purveyors of fresh and prepared food under one roof. It is truly one of Philadelphia's treasures, and essentially everyone shops there. Farm stand back in 2003, um, that's what it looked like back then, um, when Fair Food was a two-person organization. Uh, my primary goal at that time was education. I thought, what better place to educate consumers about local food than the Reading Terminal? My secondary goal was to provide an access point for local humanly raised animal products because at that time there were no farmers markets or retail outlets that sold local meat. Uh, more pictures of the early days. Uh, because of my initial goals, I started the farm stand with uh, two eight-foot folding tables and a chest freezers on Friday. I thought I'll sell a little meat and specialty produce and do a lot of education about our local food system. But the consumer demand for local food in Reading Terminal was so strong that soon I opened a second day and then a third day and then the next thing I knew I was renting walk-in space in the basement. Market management uh, offered us 
our first permanent location in 2007. You can see pictures up there. I occupied 335 square feet in the back corner of the market, which I later learned was called the ass of the market because of its inferior foot traffic. Um, but crappy location aside, by 2009 we had reached $500,000 in sales and our business was bursting at the seams. In fact, it was at this time that we started to lose money because our overhead uh, in terms of people costs continued to grow. But the place was just so jam-packed that it was difficult for customers to buy more than $10 worth of products at a time. So we were busy planning for a very minor expansion. Uh, we were calling it our cheap and cheerful renovation. Uh, when Paul Steinke, the general manager of Reading Terminal, invited us to relocate to a 750 square location in the most prominent section of the market. Uh, this is remarkable enough that a little, little ragtag business like the farm stand was being offered prime real estate in the market. Uh, but the other thing to note, for those of you who aren't local and don't know this, um, we needed to occupy the space recently vacated by Rick's Cheesesteaks. And while I won't go into the details as to why the management not to renew their lease, um, the lease of their most popular cheesesteak vendor, I will tell you that they paid a heavy price for it in the press. And uh, that the subsequent decision to invite us to lease the space was, in part, a statement from the Reading Terminal that they care about fresh and healthy and local food. Um, this was the beginning of a beautiful relationship between Fair Food and Reading Terminal. Um, I needed to raise about $150,000 to fully renovate a cheesesteak stand into a fresh food farm stand. And Go to webinar. Webents made easy. This money I have ever raised. This project was just so damn tangible and easy to wrap your head around. Um, I felt like people were throwing money at us. And this is a sharp contrast to most of our other work, which happens behind the scenes and is much harder to quantify. So that was in fall of 2009 when we moved. Um, and this year, our business is projected to do about $850,000 in sales. Um, and as I said, we are now open seven days a week, year-round, selling products sourced from over 90 family farmers and producers. Now I'm now going to speak a little bit about the ways in which we work to meet our mission and our bottom line, which are sometimes in harmony and sometimes in conflict. As I've said several times already, we buy products from over 90 family farmers and producers, as well as a growing number of food artisans. And another way to say that is that we intentionally buy from as many growers as we can. Uh, and this strategy to demonstrate the incredible bounty and diversity of the region was a decision we made long before we thought we were running a business. I don't need to tell anybody that buying from more vendors as opposed to fewer vendors. Go to webinar. Web events made easy. Over the years, we have asked ourselves if we should streamline our operation for the purpose of achieving profitability. But every time we weigh the options, we choose to do it this way. And I'll tell you why. Why? Uh, supply and demand. Uh, buying from all those growers means that we know all those growers and not in a researchy, theoretical way but a hands-on day-to-day way. We know who grows what, how they pack it, package it, price it, and deliver it. And with knowledge, we are able to consult with wholesale buyers, chefs, and retailers, and food service managers in a way that actually leads to bringing more local food into the Philadelphia marketplace, which is a line right out of our mission statement. And it's also back to building supply. Uh, the other piece of our work that most people on the outside I don't see, but we are so happy and proud of internally, is how much support we provide to growers and food artisans through our farm stand business. We provide technical assistance on everything from market trends to packing and pricing and billing, and we speak from a position of leverage. And I don't mean power, by that I mean trust, because we are loyal customers and have, a, have proven that we play an important role in building their business through recommendations to other buyers. Who's this cool folk, partly because I love it? Uh, but also uh, because this farmer, Philip Landis, is someone that I have worked with for many years. Um, we sort of came up together as he was starting his farm and I was launching Fair Food. Bill was the first livestock farmer that I really got to know, and in those early days when the farm stand was on a folding table, most of the meat in the freezer came from his farm. Well, now on, on to sell to larger markets, and we don't get a lot of his product anymore. Just a few weeks ago, Phil called to tell me that he is in a good position right now to grow his herd of pigs and asked if Fair Food could help. So I'll go into the details, but in two weeks I'll be bringing the regional manager of Bon Appetit out to his farm to discuss how Phil can supply pork for the University of Pennsylvania. 
a little bit um, about our staff and volunteers um, because they are really the backbone of our educational mission. This is actually, these are all volunteers in this photo. Uh, we talked a lot about how we carefully label our products with the farm name and the location and the variety and the growing method, and all of that is important. But it's mostly through training our staff and volunteers that we educate consumers about local food systems. Our business on a strong customer service model, and this is really important for anyone out there who is contemplating opening a similar store. We know that we're never going to match the other produce vendors in Reading Terminal on price or convenience, and we know many people who shop at RTM are not locavores. So compete on quality customer service. And as far as we're concerned, customer service and customer edu and consumer education are one and the same. We have found that engaging customers week in and week out is one of the most powerful marketing and education tools we have. We also learned that volunteers are not a replacement for staff. We learned that the hard way. And therefore, are not a cost-cutting strategy, but rather another dimension of our work in educating our community. Volunteers do spend time bagging greens and cutting cheese, but much more importantly, they talk to customers and share their enthusiasm for mission. So I uh, have some stats for you. I thought people might like to see this. Um, this is our projection for this fiscal year, which actually ends in about 15 days. Um, our biggest challenge right now is bringing in more customers. Customers. We feel we have successfully reached the local food audience, and while this audience is growing every day, we're also experiencing a lot more competition for this audience. We made our big move in 2009. We knew that we needed to grow our sales by about 35% in order to make the numbers work. Um, with the new location, it was double the space and a ton more visibility. We exceeded those expectations really quickly, uh, actually right away. Uh, but then our challenge became professionalizing our business because we were still pretty ragtag at that point and the staff did not have a background in food retail. But in the past year and a half, we did some restructuring and made some smart hiring decisions and now have good systems in place. Uh, that professionalizing costs money and we're now at a break-even point again. We recently learned from a feasibility study, I'll say generously paid for by the Wallace Center, uh, that we are capturing about 1.2% of the foot traffic in Reading Terminal. And we really want the farm stand to be making a profit. And according to the research from the feasibility study and our own instincts, um, we believe that this is possible, possible and that marketing will be the key to this next phase of our business. With that said, I feel really fortunate to be running a nonprofit organization with a farm stand business that in addition to all the ways it delivers on our mission, just half of Fair Foods operating budget employs a little over half of our staff and the self-supporting operation. So I'm going to spend my last couple minutes, I think I still have a couple minutes, I'm talking about our local grower, local buyer event. So that one-on-one -on -one consulting to buyers that I talked about earlier is still an important part of what we do. However, as the movement grows, the need for hand-holding becomes less and less important. As a profit organization, our goal has always been to act as a facilitator, make the connections, bring people together, and then get out of the way. So our local buyer was originally considered as an industry-only local food expo back in 2004. Like so many other things at Fair Food, it started very small. The first year we had 20 farmers and only five buyers. The second year farmers were pissed off, so um, we only, oh, <laughs> the second year the farmers were pissed off about the first year, so we had about 20 buyers but only five farmers. But for the event started to take form, and for the past three years we have had a steady 50 to 60 vendors, about 200 buyers and the whole thing takes place in just two hours on a Monday evening. The success of Local Grower, Local Buyer is that it is carefully curated. With such limited time, the event has to stay really focused. We only allow growers and producers and food artisans that are selling into the Philly market, and they have to be selling wholesale. In other words, not the CSA growers and those who grow exclusively for farmers markets, and we screen them pretty carefully. And, uh, we also only invite buyers, meaning those buying wholesale for a business because the goal is for growers and buyers to do as much business as they can in that short amount of time. The event is by invitation only, and we don't invite the looking to expand the event uh, and are planning for a two-day expo in early spring of 2012. Um, this will allow us the freedom to invite many more vendors, including those CSA farmers and all the urban farmers and a whole lot of other people, and also open the event to the public. Uh, the model that we know of right now this type of event is the Family Farmed Expo put by our friends in Chicago who do a three-day event which includes a portion for industry, a portion for the public, and a mini-conference. 
it's a little risky uh, to be taking on something like this. And I think I'm, I included it on this webinar so that I feel more pressure to make it happen. Uh, but I have a feeling that we're going to see more and more of these types of events popping up. And we definitely think uh, that Philly's ready. I'm done, but before I pass it back, guys, and uh, Glenn speaks, I just want to say a word about my friend Glenn Bergman from Weaver Way. Um, so Weaver's Way has been sort of the ideal partner for Fair Food. I decided to jump on the local food bandwagon about five years ago. They instantly became Fair Food members and took full advantage of our consulting services. I spent a lot of time with Gene, their produce buyer, and Dale, their meat buyer, and, and many others at Weaver's Way. But within a year, they had not only only put all recommendations into action, they had created their own local program and hired an in-house forager and gone far beyond what we could provide in terms of guidance. So I'll end there. I'm going to run that poll. Oh, sure. Do, do I do it or do you do it, Jack? No, I'll do it. I'll do it. So okay. um, I'm going to launch the poll here. Um, and this is, is our interactive piece uh, of the webinar. So if you're a nonprofit, uh, those of you for profits, um, hold your hands. Um, if you're a nonprofit running a business now as part of the nonprofit, or are planning on starting a business as part of the nonprofit, not uh, planning on any business venture, and uh, just as a catch-all, I'm not part of a nonprofit. Is your last uh, possible choice? So we'll give people just a few minutes, or not a few minutes, a few seconds uh, to vote. So early. Um, and that's uh, some more coming in. Uh, make sure you, you uh, click the appropriate box. This, this is what we call in the radio business air filling. All right, we got uh, over three quarters uh, of people voted, so I'm going to close the poll and show everyone um, what we got. Um, so, like, uh, there are or quite a few nonprofits on, um, and uh, many are uh, of, of those who are nonprofits, more are either running a business or starting a business than not. Um, very interesting. Um, thank you for participating in the poll. Um, and uh, now back to John to introduce Glenn. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to kind of break with protocol here, and if I could ask Anne. A couple of questions that came up specific, I think, it might be good to handle those. Sure. Um, what's the square footage of your new space there, the retail space? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, the whole space is about 750 square feet, which for the retail terminal is actually quite large. Mm -hmm. And out of that 750 square feet, about 200, a little more than 200 of it is sort of back of the house, you know, triple sink, mop kind of stuff. That sure. About 550 um, retail space. And the other question that, uh, and there's a couple around this that I think you touched on as well, it's around the business model and around the fact that you're a nonprofit. And so a couple of questions, why are you staying a nonprofit? Right. You know, and then the other is, you know, talk about oh, what are structure, is it a 501c3? When you say social enterprise, what do we mean? Sure. So say about right. that. So Fair so Food is a 501c3, and the farm stand is still a program of Fair Food. I have a feeling that going to change soon. Um, this is part of a much longer story about how we, uh, Fair Food started as a program of another organization called White Dog Community Enterprises, and a few years ago we spun off and had to get 501c3 status on our own. And I must say the IRS was not thrilled about the fact that we were applying for nonprofit status and we're already running a half a million dollar business. Um, but we knew still about sort of how we were, you know, we were in a period of transition, so I didn't want to do anything new, but I think that we may have to eventually spin off the business as um, an independent, as an SD, and then uh, Fair Food would be the sole shareholder. Yeah, I just I thought it'd be worthwhile covering those early yeah. on here before we go into Glenn. Great. So uh, Glenn Bergman is with us today. Glenn is a lifelong food enthusiast with a degree in public health. And he's worked for eight years as the executive chef and general manager at Philadelphia's famed Commissary Restaurant. But that was before joining the corporate world and as a regional director for operations at the Woodney and Compass Group. Ever since Glenn joined Weaver's Way as general manager in 2004, they called financial controls and computer systems increased sales from 5.4 million to 8 million and sustained profitability. And they created a nonprofit arm to Weaver's Way's expanded educational programs. With that, let's come to Glenn and 
hear what he has to say about retail today. Go ahead. Thank you, John. And, uh, and let's try and move this forward. Uh, Weaver's do wanna, Way. Do you want to start out with the poll about uh, co-ops? Sure, that'd be great. See if there's right, co-op so, so members let's, out let's, there. Yeah, another um, uh, interactive poll. Um, since you guys are well pressed now, um, what describes your involvement in food co-ops? Um, I'm a, a member, an employee, or um, manager. Um, I've been involved in the past, or nope, uh, no, no involvement yet, or in the past. Now, okay. just another couple seconds for people to get their vote in. Oh, let's let's see. I'm going to close the voting. And um, a quarter of people are uh, co-op members, and a um, few uh, are employees um, or uh, have been involved in the past. About half never uh, been involved in a food co-op. Right. I got the most to do. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, uh, Weaver's Way Co-op. Um, let me see if I can move forward. Is a we are not a one hundred and three C. We are a, a not for profit business that is a is a sub chapter T corporation as a as a food co op. We have eight hundred household members who own the business. That's approximately ten thousand people it represents. We are located in the northwest section of Philadelphia. Uh, we started in 1972 as a buying club and incorporated as the uh, as the uh, co-op in 1973. Uh, our sales were about four million dollars uh, seven years ago. We have now three stores of, of, for about 15 million dollars this year. A uh, local purchase, which has gotten greater over the past few years, is about two and a half million dollars, and so use a radius of about 150. Million miles, similar to Ann and Fair Food. The total about 8,000 square feet of retail space, and there's more space than that in the back, and that's about $2,000 per square foot. And for those of you who are, might be in the retail business, $2,000 a square foot is quite a lot. Uh, we are uh, um, a convention grocery store would be somewhere between $700 to $800 a square foot. We also operate two urban farms, uh, which are five and a half acres. I'm going to go into that a little, little bit more. And last year's revenue, we expect to be about $140,000 in, um, in sales of just produce. Come to the public, we're not open just to members. For many years, we were just a member uh, only cooperative. And our Weaver's Way community programs, which started in 2008, is our nonprofit arm, which helps us do uh, programs in education, and I'll get to that a little bit more. This is the store in uh, Maori, which is in the northwest section, started in 1973, 3,500 square feet, and now doing about $7 million a year in business. There's a lot. And we're free from a, and, and uh, they have very successful operation. It's on two floors. The store that we just opened up uh, a year thousand square feet, and this is in a right on the main street of a shopping district. And the store we renovated an old grocery store that had a business, uh, which had been there for about a hundred years, and was missed. And sales have been uh, about twice of what we expected to be. Third, so we opened, but we opened about three years ago, was our claim store, and this store is about five hundred square feet of retail with a total of 700 square feet footprint. Very small corner store as you can see here. Uh, we were, this request came from the community to our board to whether or not a small grocery store in a uh, city that didn't have fresh vegetables could be successful. And I will go into that more at the end, but uh, sales have been only year, last year $250,000. 
than we had expected. The started about 10 years ago as a demonstration farm on a quarter of an acre, basically to do nutrition education with our members who wanted to volunteer and do education in the community. In 2007, we hired a full-time farmer and expanded the farm to three quarters of an acre. In the first brought in the $6,000 worth of bells, mainly to the store. We had done that, we realized that this, we, while we lost money the first year, we realized that by expanding, we would be able to increase sales. And the Orbury site, which is where we are on an arboretum, is two and a half acres. And this past year, uh, had retail sales of $75,000. Two years ago, three years ago, we started a program at the Small School for Agriculture here in Philadelphia, which is the largest urban ag school, I believe, in the country, uh, on three acres of what was then just uh, grass land and sort of a CSA in the community. It's a miles from our store. And uh, last year was 65,000 in sales. We've all combined that with a CSA from a lo local farm who does uh, goat's cheese. And uh, people can sign up for that. And we also sell meat from the salt school from animal had come from the farm. The uh, we opened up was a uh, farm on a, at a homeless shelter, close store is, and there's two residents, and that program has continued to expand, and we're getting that to go from a, about a quarter an acre to about an acre in the next couple of years. The, uh, the shelter program is that it provides a chance for education and another sort of recreation for the children who are inside the shelter. This is a picture of our Arboretum farm at, at Orbury Arboretum. And you can see that it lives in the countryside. However, Ryan, this photograph is the uh, crane line. And it is covered, but you can see them going by. That line that you see here in the center says Harvest Program. That is a program run by the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society. Seedlings are started in the prisons and brought down to us in, our, in a greenhouse where we harden them all and then out to the community gardens throughout the city of Philadelphia. And the product that comes from that is then donated. And I believe last year was about 26,000 pounds of the product. The Henry Got Crops, which is our farm program at the Saul School. These are those who started it here on the right side. And they also named it by after the street that goes by the school. We have members of the CSA at $700 uh, for a season, for a share. and we also sell half shares. So that's from a very successful program. Each of these school, each of these programs, we also have a farm educator, the farmer who coordinates all the farm education programs, both saw and at Orbury, and what we run through our nonprofit called We Community Programs. So here they're putting up a hoop out on the site. <coughs> This is a lot of Philadelphia and show where our farms are. There is another one here. This is the Salt School. This is the, um, now we have an empty lot where we also plant things like just leeks. Uh, or this year it's peppers. This is the farm. So they're very close to each other. And then here is the uh, Martin Luther King's and farm at a high school nearby, but also right next to that is the homeless shelter. So they're relatively close to each other. This next map is a little bit harder to read. Um, I think I'll just uh, try and get back to it. Uh, it shows the locations of the stores. And it, this is Chet Hill. This, this is the uh, location of the stores and the location of the farms. Are here. So you can see they're relatively close to each other. These bots are programs that we run through our nonprofit in the local schools uh, where we do sort of mini co-ops and nutrition education programs. So I just wanted to show you how close everything is. Everything is within about a three-mile radius. The Air Food uh, the website is dedicated to bringing locally grown foods to the to the marketplace and promoting humane, sustainable agricultural 
access in the Philadelphia region. Well, I read this uh, on our mission. It's very, it's very similar. Where we are also tied into community services for the greater good and change the cooperative model and to strengthen the local economy, which are one of our main ends of our mission. The substance of what we there are some, but for tie directly to what Fair Food is doing, which is local economic development, uh, emphasis on local minimally processed and ethically produced goods, collaborative relationships with uh, many different organizations. And they also do information about uh, values around food and consumer issues. So the four things tie directly to a relationship also with fair food. So when fair food came along, they just saw that there was a, a wall tie between our two organizations. And what is what that what that's done for us as a retail operation that provides not just locally produced because the 150 mile radius of products is only one part of what we provide. So we have broad line products, we have we have organic products, we have conventional products also. So this is here in the store. There's probably about 50% of our produce is conventional produce. Uh, a lot of gluten-free, regular grocery lines. We even have a store across the street that does nothing but pet food, food good cat food. And so we sell chicken feed because of the growth of the number of people raising chickens in the Philadelphia area. And we're providing that as a service to them so they don't have to go out of town to get uh, the feed. coffees, things like that. But with an emphasis, as we can, on local products. And that's where Fair, Fair Food comes in and assists us. We're owned and of course do a lot of education on food politics and nutrition as a co-op. Like food, it's nonprofit. Uh, it has a specific and mission-driven market around local food, and uh, their education work around local products and humanely raised products ties directly to our mission and around our food uh, mission. So the way that Weaver's Way uses fair food to help us in both finding product is they list of local suppliers, and it's published list wherever their organization, and from that we can look through that as a buyer, whether they're in produce, whether they're in meat, we can look at that and get a feel for who Fair Food is working with and who might be able to call up or take a look at. Uh, our role is a part-time, what we call local buyer or forager, who will go out and look at the farms, but they will also use the Fair Food book as a point of resource. About the meet the farmer nights, so the on the at the ready market, and those are something that we send as many people as we can to to really get to see the farmers we already may have relationships with, but we want to see other people who are there and see whether or not we have uh, a product that we can use. The fair farm stand at the ready market is also something that we take people down to take a look at what they have in season, what they're doing, so that we can also judge perhaps and mirror what we should be getting from uh, suppliers. And sometimes we can't do that because of the price point, and sometimes we can. Our events throughout the year that brings the uh, retailers like Weaver's Way is that we talk, there's restaurants who come to these events, there's other groceries and other co-ops in this region, and as Anne said, the other institutions, such as LaSalle College chef will show up and actually talk to them and find out what they're doing and how they're working. And they may also have other contacts. So what food does is actually the focal point and brings us together. The event that we attended for, with Fair Food at the Ready was back just in last month in May. And here is a uh, picture of a gentleman on the left who's the general manager of a co-op just outside town. So in the middle is one of his board members. And the woman on the right, uh, I could have done better on this, is Juex, who actually started all of this with White Dog. I took this picture and put it in here because it was our first farm educator four years ago when we started expanding the farm. He was here as a supplier, and David is doing a number of things that we that it's very innovative. One is he's a farmer in an urban environment, and what he does is he puts out an app, app application so that you can find out 
one season and where it is. So he might say a tree on a certain street in a certain place in Philadelphia using peas or apples or cranberry or whatever it might be, cran apples, and that if you go there at this time, you can just pick them because it's hanging over a wall. He will go around and pick things and sell them um, to restaurants and uh, to us. He also has now packaging uh, syrup uh, locally and little bottles. You'll see a picture of that that we're now buying from him based on going to this event. Uh, the gentleman in the middle here is our fish buyer and also works in our meat and poultry department. And, uh, there's Anne on the right, and, and we are at the event, at the event looking at uh, suppliers. And one, uh, here are some quags from a local farm that uh, we actually bought some of those just to try them out. And the gentleman is from Lancaster um, Forest Co-op, and we use them as uh, a major supplier of Food Lancaster, they're a collective that brings food together from other farms and then brings it into the city. Our major supplier of ours. There's a chef in the middle from Cafe Stell. He's the owner, and he uh, grows or he buys all of his product is local when he can get, and he also cures his own meats, makes his own scrapple, it's a popular here, uh, makes his own bacon. In, but he's at the event, and uh, it's we every year. And go eat at his restaurant, so it's nice to see both. Do both. This gentleman uh, sells to us uh, hummus and dressings and salads. And he's his daughter. He brings his daughter along. I should mention that my daughter was also in two of those other pictures. So it's a great event that they put on. Some that we have had here at one event. I actually walked out with a case of eggs about three years ago, multicolored eggs, and since then we've been selling them here at about uh, eight dozen a week. We also bring in some brown eggs, uh, local uh, cake-free, and, um, uh, and the, the contacts were made at this event. This is produce from Lancaster Farm Fresh and other farmers. Uh, we have a local cranberry supplier who he picks uh, and brings them into us again. Someone we met through the Fair Food uh, program. Uh, Bodies from Gilda. There's a picture of her previously. Uh, also another one that we found, and then sprouts and greens from another supplier who was at the event both last year and this year. Bakers, another supplier of uh, both organic and grass-fed meat. And here's our meat buyer, Dale, who initially, when, when Fair started, immediately started purchasing and uh, attending these meetings and brought these products in. This is our uh, debtor, who, who, who these uh, locally made products that we found both before Fair Food, but also uh, Fair Food has started with it. This is a crowd that's being made here, it's Kensington, I think, old or something. Uh, that's David Siller's product, and we're now uh, sit here in the store. Right from that uh, to our store within a matter of just uh, a month. Other organizations that we partner with for local sourcing are the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, uh, Lancaster Farm Fresh, I mentioned, the Con Market, with a uh, aggregator of product and uh, also delivers local product. Penn State Extension Services, the food trust, <clears throat> which brings farmers in to farmers markets in the city. We get to meet them also just by meeting them at uh, farm markets. Farm City, another uh, farm program, and uh, the Growers Alliance, which is a, a, a foundation of the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, GA uh, funding, and we really where we purchase local product from small urban farm planners. Uh, so, in closing, I just wanted to mention that, that relationship of a nonprofit such as Fair Food that it runs and way, which is a cooperative, but a retail store, and it doesn't have to be a co-op. It could just be a, a retail 
uh, the community. It could be a regular grocery store. Opportunity to use their knowledge and sort of local product helps us meet the needs of our community and also of our mission. Comprehensive uh, presentation. I think raising a number of questions that I've got in front of me, but let me let me start with the one that I've got. You know, I noticed you've got three stores, and one's uh, doing a lower volume, and um, you made it's in a uh, an area that was the community asked for fresh food, healthy food, access to food, and so you put a store there. Tell us tell us a little bit about how that's performing and why you think it's uh, performing the way it is. What what can we learn from that? Well, let me give you an example. We expected that we would do somewhere in the area of a half a million dollars a year in sales, $10,000 a week. And to our, our board, we requested that we look at this site specifically and see whether or not uh, we would be interested in opening the store in our, uh, keeping a store that has already sort of functioning uh, and open a few days a week. We also received a small grant to renovate the store of about $120,000 of air conditioning and things like that. And we have no reason why, with our program being successful here, that it wouldn't be successful there. What we miss on this, and the average basket here is a 30 to $32, or it was at the time, um, here at Mary. And we figured that it would be perhaps less than that, I mean half of that or even a little bit less, but we did not expect was that it would be only about eight or nine dollars a basket. What we find is that, that it wasn't the community coming to us and asking us, it was a community organization. And what we had failed to do was try and develop a membership base first from a standpoint because it's very specific types of food and it's a narrow area. For example, we don't sell we don't sell sodas fructose corn syrup in it, then we don't sell actual brands of chips um, and things like that, and uh, we don't sell cigarettes, you know, uh, or lottery tickets, which is the typical corner grocery store. Well, what we're serving and has been to bring together both uh, in the initial part our organic food, our local, our huge product, but then work and reset it again a year later and found that that still didn't work and now we set it again by providing some prepared foods and smoothies and, and uh, um, uh, vegetables, so juices, see if that's going to work or not. But it, we've lost about $240,000 over the last three years and we looked at that as being an attempt to try and get it right on the corner store in an urban area. Mean that or not, not uh, it did look as though we can. The things that we do is our labor and wage rates are rare high. So it looks like wages against our sales, but how much we continue to increase, our wages will sort of outstrip the profit on the other end and led to about 700000 a year. So those are the problems that we have for a small store. Perhaps it should have been um, three or 4,000 square feet with more of your product both can build organic, local product, uh, so that people could do more of their shopping there rather than having to use our store for some small things and then going to a larger grocery store three miles away from the uh, from the smaller store in West Coast Plain. I had some good insight and probably stimulated some further questions that uh, um, we may get back to in a in a moment. So we're going to go into. Uh, uh, questions now, and let me pull from that. There's a significant up here, but uh, let me start with a few um, direct ones. I think for you, two or three here. Someone asked you: You use online technology for your CSA and ordering, etc. What do you guys do there? Up online, but then uh, with PayPal, people pay, send the check in, and what we do is they will do an application online. But, uh, and send their check to hold to hold their space back in the uh, um, fall or early early winter, but then they pay usually by check. Okay. 
another specific one, um, does Weaver's Way the retail prices, the produce prices from the co-op on a cost management structure or is it based on market drivers such as terminal prices? How do you, how are the basis for prices? Well, we set certain margins on our thing by the department and uh, what we're trying to obtain. Uh, the Estoe Glane store is uh, budgeted to be at a lower margin, specifically because of the neighborhood, and try and get people in the store. And then we also look at the prices that are in the market, uh, and what the market prices are. But uh, for the most part, we just try and put a percentage for each bar to put onto their product. We don't sort of play around usually too much with lower margins. Uh, a couple questions about economic impact here. One is, uh, what is the record buying impact resulting from your consumer education programs? So are you seeing an impact from those on sales? I think, well, whatever, that people who have gone to, like, those come to the farm and have some time with us, believe is happening is that they are a little bit more attuned to uh, vegetables and, and make some decisions. This is only anecdotal and we don't have any studies to that. But that's some of the feelings that we're getting from the, uh, what we are getting though, you should know, are other young people interested in doing internships or volunteering at the farm just to learn about what's going on. How to do uh, farming and what it means from an ecological standpoint, environmental standpoint. Um, and that's been very exciting. Most of the people who are working on our farm are, you know, to about 30 years old, and um, it's a very tight or group that has uh, gotten involved with, with the situation of um, urban farming and um, economic development around that. So you're really creating, in a sense, a long-term long investment in these young people who will, you know, we think. be with this for a long time. Yeah. Right. So, so here's a question that I think probably goes to both Anne and Glenn. Um, it's asking about jobs. You know, if we get this from economic development or job creation, how many jobs have come out of what you're both doing, whether it be the farm, the co-op, the stands? You might even think about the farmers that are selling to you. Is it a significant portion of what they're doing such that they're creating full or part-time jobs? Easy one for me because we just have the one store. Um, and uh, we employ eight people for uh, just, it just, just for the farm stand. We're all for fair food, but eight for them to stand. And for farms, uh, we have a farm at each place, so and we have gardens, uh, and those totally uh, cut by the sales of the produce. So it's one farmer for each site, so there's two farmers and two gardens. So you could look at parts of the hundred thousand dollars with wages and benefits put on. Uh, and so there's some jobs right there. Also noticed in the farms that we do, it's, and the, our farms are really about education. Uh, they produce product, can have a farm and pay for the farmers, and so they believe in. But what we'll to do with the education of people to be able to leave us and go on and do other farms in the city. And what we have now, our interns last year are now doing a three-acre farm, um, near about four or five miles away. Uh, one of our interns from years ago is farming about a half acre in North Philadelphia, specifically for a restaurant in uh, Philadelphia. So, three interns over the past two years are uh, employed farming in Philadelphia also. So, I uh, we believe that, that small scale urban farming like this has an opportunity for job training and also producing some economic uh, impact to the city. The thing is, by buying local. We have not done a study to show the economic effect of that, but, by, but they have done this up in uh, New England, uh, over co-op and a number of co-ops up in that area have an economic study on that, but the, the reason buying local and keeping dollars within the community is, is relatively uh, important for economic development. Yeah, I also want to say, uh, John, I, it, it sounds like part of what you're asking is, you know, does this work have an impact on the growers? And 
we don't, like Glenn, we haven't done that evaluation, although it, it's something that we're thinking about a lot now, not so much with our farm stand. Um, is rel you know, relatively small, but we are thinking about it a lot right now with our farm to school program. Um, we would love to be able to do um, some evaluation that would value, you know, on both ends, looking at what the impact is on the growers as well as what the impact is on the kids in the school. So we're, we're trying to find that money right now to do that. Yeah, excellent. I think that's a good trend. I mean, you know, the further we get down this uh, path in this movement, I think the more evidence we're going to need and we're knocking on these kind of things. So I'm glad to hear that. Uh, okay, back to questions. Uh, someone asks, is there a commercial production kitchen associated with either one of what you're doing? Some of the slides that you showed, Glenn, had some sauerkraut and some other processed milk product. Uh, are they standalone, so they're related to your organisms? Tell us more yeah, about we that. Don't, we don't, um, unless we bring the product in and we cook it, cook the product and then sell it in the store, we don't have a commercial kitchen for using local products for the purpose of, of uh, taking local product and then turning it into something. The sauerkraut is done by David somewhere else, and um, uh, we don't do anything like that right now. We have talked about uh, doing an incubator kitchen, but uh, um, that's hopefully for the future. We have several incubator kitchens happening in Philadelphia right now. There's uh, Green Square Farm, which is an urban farm in the Kensington area, has a commercial kitchen, and the Enterprise Center um, in West Philadelphia is has been planning a, a large-scale incubator kitchen for a while now, and they're you know they're they're really on their way, and and we all hope to see that happen in the next year or two. Another synergistic uh, yeah. organization for you folks. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, we talked a bit about uh, Ann's business model. Let's go talk about the co-op business model. A question comes in about why is it good model for local food access. There, the profit that is made here uh, goes back to the members or back into programming. And so the, the co-op model is one which allows for, for to also help drive that. So uh, what we've found in co-op that the member is very much uh, tuned into what's going on and also supports through pricing and for that mission. So in some ways, people join the co-op up to have this to be part of that mission and I believe that I had never seen anything like that until I joined here a uh, few years ago the um, how people are tied to the product and to the people who work here uh, and mission of the entity so I think there's something to be said for it but it doesn't mean that it does, can't happen it is happening at places like Whole Foods and it's happening it will happen at some grocery stores already uh, in Philadelphia, but um, it's clearly something where the the owners are tuned into the mission and are part of that. So, so a captured audience. And uh, just to add to that, it also it's a convenient way to raise capital. Is that true? That's Leading true. We were expanding. Formats. When we were expanding, we went to our members who are the owners. Uh, we have a five million dollar project. We were able to raise within a very short time three quarters of a million dollars in member loans as of that expansion and also get people to put more money in their equity above the required equity uh, which it's on the balance sheet and uh, helps us be a little bit more um, financially secure. Co-op in West Philadelphia called Mariposa which is right now in the middle of an expansion project and been able to raise about a quarter million dollars I think and are proceeding to raise a little bit more for their expansion project, which starts construction in the next weeks. Any downsides to the co-op model, do you think? Well, there are some, but uh, it's the ability to make uh, some chis quickly is it can be, um, and so there are certain mission-driven things by the members that perhaps may not be uh, the right thing for business uh, purposes, but is an important thing for uh, members. And um, for example, uh, seeing in certain sodas, for example, that have any sugar in it, but the logo on the outside of the, the uh, bottle is something that the members don't like. But uh, so you don't necessarily go for ink sales. 
on a product that is sort of okay when the, many of the members complained about the product itself, so you take it off and you might lose sales from that, but that's part of uh, the consensus of running the business. Great, thanks for that insight. Uh, uh, to you, Anne, a specific question around business supports that you offer the growers. Uh, and specifically, they ask, are enterprise budgets part of the tools that you may be and the data yeah. that you're offering out there? I saw that question. I, um, and I guess the question is whether or not we help people with their business plans and business models. Is that how I should interpret that question? Uh, I think so. I mean, yeah. you could maybe think it broadly as just their enterprise, maybe management, yeah. structure, financing, et cetera. Yeah. No, I say we, we really don't do that just because we don't really have that, that expertise. We do spend a lot of time, I, I mean, you know, it goes in so many different directions. As I said earlier, um, we used to do that kind of training in, in formal ways. There was a period of time uh, back in like 2000, I'm bad time, date, but like 2006, we were having that sort of panic about supply, and we spent a couple of years doing workshops in counties all around the state, uh, all around in the state, around Philadelphia. Um, in the uh, talking to farmers, training farmers on how to sell into the wholesale marketplace, and eventually we also included into the institutional marketplace. Um, but now, with uh, with the farm stand and with the, the fact that we interact with farmers all day, every day, it, like I said, it happens in a more informal way. But you know, we'll do everything from from field phone calls from farmers who call and say, I've, you know, I got ten head of cattle and I want to expand twenty, uh, to farmers like Philip Landis that I mentioned in my presentation where he really has a, a larger operation and he, he's looking to grow it because he has the opportunity now to get more, uh, more piglets and so and there and we're you know trying to channel that to an institutional market so I just I mean uh, what I say often is that we sort of in cases like that like with Philip we really kind of dig in with him um, and help him make connections but it's really not around the business plan that's really his job I have I must say though it's I, it's the kind of work we don't really get paid for. It's, it's a cult, you know, so it, it's just, it's just part of what we do. It's sort of uh, ingrained in, in the work that we do here at Fair Food is that work with farmers. Right, Hamon. I've seen that in a number of what might be called social enterprises that are doing that, working either up or down the supply chain to build capacity. In a sense, it's that value chain relationship that you're creating. Yeah. Uh, uh, quite a question for both of you. Someone talk about you know they live in an area where there um, there is a natural foods co-op uh, local producers. It sounds like there's a good bit going on. However, call for more um, more purchasing options, and they're looking for ways to expand the options that would um, existing enterprises and maybe not create competition or take product from them. Create uh, a robots kind of scenario. So it's a community and dynamic question, and the question is around any tips for going carefully. Um, they you know, add that about 25 within a 25 mile radius, they've got about 400,000 population. So it sounds like a significant um, market there. So tips for tips for uh, raising all boats without hurting others. Well, I would, um, this is cool. I would I would definitely. Uh, speak the general manager or to the board of members about their long-term goals and to see what, to do a customer survey or a community survey of what else is uh, needed community, what people are asking for, and then to either work with the cup or find another way of um, supplying that that would help both. And one of the things that we did was had a farm market uh, located right by the store, across the street from the store, and some people said, well, isn't that going to take away business from you? And what we found that on Thursday nights when we had the farmer's market across the street, actually our sales were up. Because people came from a wider area to come to the farmer's market and then they came into the store. So this is an example, I think, of where we thought we wanted to try it out and see what happened, uh, where we had two or three farmers outside uh, the street. One of them was our farm and found that our Thursday night sales increased and we saw some synergy to that. I assume I'm not divulging anything I shouldn't, Glenn, but I remember when I uh, was meeting with you and uh, Ned the other week and you told me that opening your Chestnut Hill store, did, did you did sales go down in your Mount Airy store, which was something that you anticipated, but you have created your own competition and took some of your audience from one of your stores to the other. 
Well, no, we were doing $8.6 million in 200 square feet. That's a lot. One of the complaints <laughs> we received from our members was that it was too crowded and uh, many people were leaving because of the fact that, not leaving, but we're not doing as much because it was too crowded. So doing a market study, we found if we opened up within three miles of where we are, we would lose about 15% of our business, make it less crowded here in the corner. Uh, and the residents who live around here where parking can be tough would be a little bit happier. Sure enough, uh, we opened it up, and in 15, it's about 23% of sales have migrated to the new store. It's, a longer, it's still doing excellent sales here in Mount Airy at about $7 million a year. Um, anyone would be happy with those sales, uh, but the place is not as crowded on a weekend or on a Friday night as it used to be. So that's helped us a great deal. The thing I want to say about competition, um, I think that this is part of being the director of a nonprofit and running a business as part of our nonprofit. Um, you know, competition has always been really confusing for me because my uh, role as a quasi business owner is that we're trying to make the business profitable, and my role as a nonprofit director is that we're trying to get other people to do the same thing that we do. And I, I, I think I've, I've matured a little bit over the last few years. Um, you know, I let my staff get that about competition and, and I try to take a, a, a sort of a bigger view and know that our job is to always sort of you know all our own competition because we're out there sharing our resources with every single uh, owner or anybody else who wants it and um, I think that the the um, challenge for us and for any nonprofit doing this kind of work is that you constantly have to innovate you just constantly have to be looking at the next thing and sort of the next thing that no one else can try because they're they, they're not in a nonprofit and they you know and, and profitability has sort of it looks a little different to them. Great, thanks to you both. Uh, we're, we're getting a little on time, so let's try one, one more here. It's a it's a bit of a detail, but also an expansive question. So um, I'll stay focused on it, I guess. The question is around um, the nuts and bolts of aggregating product. Um, how you aggregate local farmers' products? Do you actually co-mingle cucumbers, et cetera, or do you keep it all separate? How do you handle traceability? Someone also asked about um, food safety and those kind of things. Um, so what are we about nuts and bolts here? I'll start. Um, you know, I, again, this is about so much about our educational mission. I mean, we are, we are crazy careful um, about how we label things and identify things, not because um, we're hung up on, on uh, on traceability, um, but because it's a it's a big part of our educational mission. So from you know we uh, we go to such great lengths to label everything because we want people to know what farm it came from and what county it was grown in and, and what the method is and what you know all the variety, all that kind of stuff. So um, we don't commingle things for that reason, and and it's also a big part of sort of the education of the staff and the volunteers to really to be able to identify the products and where they came from. And so that's how that's what we do. We when we bring in product the a farm, we keep it separate from every other product. So we could have, for example, the other day, four different types of costs. We had from our farm, we had from a, a farm in Lancaster, we had a conventional um, product, uh, look, sorry, there's three different types. So there's uh, three or even four different types of product, all in different places and not all mingled. And accordingly to where it kind of comes from, whether it's from a, a specific farm, if we know where it's coming from, we'll put the name on there, just as uh, Fair Food does. Okay, I might just okay, add great. a little bit. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, but quickly if you got it. I was going to say that you know, by the nature of our business, we are aggregating a lot of farm products, and I know that it's something that people want to see more and more of and, and the rise of food hubs and local food distribution and you know, oftentimes people press us to, to do that aggregation more than just for our own retail location. We think about it sometimes but it's just not really appropriate for the sort of density of where we are in Center City and the size of our store. Okay. And just one really quick question because I can't help but ask this one. Being in Northeast, someone says, well, what do you do when it's, when it's not? The reason, if your your business models in some sense seem predicated upon local fresh type of thing, maybe so much the co-op, but certainly and, and your work. Yeah. How do you handle that? Well, yeah, people ask us that all the time. Um, so part of it is that we don't just sell produce. Um, you know, we sell a lot of meat and dairy 
thinking about it, et cetera. And the other thing is that, you know, our local season is, I don't think it's as short as people think. I mean, we feel really comfortably stocked through December. We still feel pretty good for the next couple months. People always say, what do you do in February? And the real question is, what the hell do you do in April? Like, that's when it really hurts. And we do have a couple months there where we lose money, like a couple months where we have to just kind of wait it out because um, produce is the thing we mark up the most, you know, we actually make money on, and, and we have a couple months that are tough, but, you know, we make it back the next month. But we all are, all are, are also kind of expanding our product um, offerings, and um, we haven't done it with produce yet, but we are right now getting dried beans from New York, and we do also think about maybe kind of expanding the boundaries a little bit as we profitability. Any comments? With a mute. Take that as a no. No. no okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thanks to you, thanks to you both. I think uh, a lot of good questions. Nice job fielding those questions and great presentations. Um, thanks for being with us. Let me turn it back over to Jeff now to close the webinar. I want to add my thanks to Anne and Glenn, and also to you, John. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. Uh, I keep, think you can see that Weaver's Way Co-op and Fair Food are, if you will, pardon reference, two great tastes that taste great together. Both the organizations doing incredible work to get more good food into the food system, the core goal of the National Good Food Network. Um, so I want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded uh, and will be archived on our site along with more than two dozen other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to point others you think might uh, like to have heard what you heard today uh, and take some of your own professional development time, dig through our excellent archives. We do have uh, the webinar organized um, so if you have particular interests, feel free to use that left-hand navigation there. NGFN webinars are the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Uh, Sign-up links are at ngfn.org slash webinars, and uh, in the post-webinar survey, you can sign up uh, for our next webinar, which is on the Healthy Food Financing Initiative. The Fresh Food Financing Initiative was started in 2004 in Pennsylvania. The state legislature put up 30 million to fund retail in underserved rural and urban communities across the state. That $30 million was effectively quintupled by the community development financial institution that managed the initiative since they raised an additional $120 million to establish the funding pool. Through grants and loans, the program has affected over 80 stores, most independently and locally owned. The Obama administration, inspired in part by the Fresh Food Financing Initiative and by Michelle Obama's Let's Move Initiative, created a $400 million healthy food financing initiative. Um, this was announced as a complex program that spans three agencies, Treasury, Health and Human Services, and the Department of Agriculture. The goals are similar, as described by the federal government in the announcement, uh, to, again, to address in what they call deserts across the country. As HFFI money is just starting to come out. We're bringing together representatives from each of the HFFI agencies to explain their interests and priorities, their programs, and other funding opportunities for good food and agencies. So this should be a stellar webinar. Uh, there is an opportunity for one-click registering in the post-webinar survey. Uh, and if you want to hear about all of our upcoming webinar announcements, feel free to sign up for our mailing list, another one-click option in the post-webinar survey. The Walk Center is part of a national food hub collaboration studying food hubs across the country to learn how best to support them. We have created a food hub resource page at foodhub.info. In addition to the list and map of food hubs we're aware of, there's a way to let us know uh, about any we're missing. Look for research, news and events, and other resources on that page. If you're a consultant and would like to uh, be able to uh, you're, able to help developing or existing food hubs, there's a link for you to add your name and contact information. And just today, our National Food Hub or USDA launched their own Food Hub research page. There is a link to the USDA page as well from foodhub.info. Find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name, interests, your bio, and other information to our growing database of people, organizations, and funders, increasing your ability to connect to people in and across regions, within your region and across regions. This is all part of the NGFN acting as a connector. Look for the database link in the resources section of our site. And please contact us at any time. Our email address is contact at ngfn.org. The 
and would like to thank you for your time to get today. Once again, let me encourage you to fill out the survey. They will open your web browser in just a moment. And this concludes the webinar.